on, we found out how effective they were in the Pacific Theater, and by Iwo Jima, over 480 of them were issued per division. I hate that I'm dealing with the airways. <laughs> What's worse, I'm an airwinger. I say he's doing up by the Iwo Jima, like say 480 of these were taken ashore, like say with each division, and every grunt was trained how to use them. Normally they would send a man to the rear, they would pick up a flamethrower, take it to a fixed position and need to be taken out, they would dump the tank, drop it, and then uh, like the engineers would come up and clean it up behind it. By the latter part of World War II, we also had several other weapons that were being used in conjunction with the flamethrower. The first of which was an M1 carbine, this was a secondary weapon, or like say in, by Korea, this had actually been modified into the M2, like that, which was fully automatic. This was designed for support personnel, like a flamethrower operator, to, uh, like, or radio operators, officers, and non-commissioned officers, to be able to use something that was going to be smaller than the standard service rifles and allow them to do their job better. And the weapon was effective at close range, but as they found in Korea, it was very, very ineffective at longer ranges. In fact, some of the veterans we've interviewed during the Korean War, saying during Cho Sen, when uh, the North Koreans were coming at them because of the heavy winter clothing, the quilted clothing they were wearing, they would empty full magazines out of this weapon and the Chinese would get up and keep coming. <laughs> Outstanding weapon for a pogue in the rear with the gear. I like that, but for the grunts on the sharp end, like there was a kind of a love-hate relationship with the weapon. Now another weapon that has a much earlier history and was used extensively during World War II with the flamethrower is the Browning automatic rifle. Now the BAR, designed by John Browning in 1918, was first used at the beginnings of uh, like the American involvement during World War I. By World War II, it became the standard squad automatic weapon of the United States Marine Corps. By uh, Iwo Jima, in the latter part of the war, this M1918A2 variation that you see here was standard not only used in the rifle squad, but it was also used in support of the flamethrowers. Landing on Iwo Jima, the engineers did have their own teams, known as blowtorch and course crew teams. These teams were made up of two flamethrower operators and two Browning automatic riflemen. The two flamethrower operators would work in tandem. One would lay down covering fire while the other one could move close enough to the target to put flame on target. The two Browning automatic riflemen not only functioned as assistant gunners, they also laid down covering fire to make sure the Japanese wasn't going to flank and do the same thing to our flamethrower operators we were trying to do them. Now the weapon itself had two cyclic rates of fire. It was fully automatic, but it could slow the rate of fire down to 350 rounds a minute for more precision firing, or it could rock and roll at 550 rounds a minute on the fast rate of fire. The only drawback of the weapon, it was very man portable, single man operated, but it operated instead of a belt that you would normally see in a machine gun, it operated out of a 20 round box magazine. The drawback of that, at 550 rounds, you did a lot of changing of magazines. Now interestingly enough, so Mr. Ring here, like that, is a very good, uh, substantial guy. But at the beginning of World War II, the average Marine that was issued these weapons was usually the smallest man in a rifle squad. If you can imagine the poor Depression-era kids coming into the Marine Corps at that time, they weighed 110 pounds, soaking wet with the rocks full of pockets, or pockets full of rocks, uh, like that, this was a daunting weapon, because the Browning Automatic itself, without a magazine in it, weighs over 20 pounds. Another two pounds with a full box magazine of ammunition, if you notice the belt he's wearing around his waist, that's another 10 magazines at 2 pounds apiece. There's another 20 pounds worth of ammunition he's carrying on. So before he even gets into his own personal combat load, he's carrying between 45 and 50 pounds of a weapon and ammunition alone. <laughs> now the Marines, all of the Army, as they did have assigned assistant gunners, by 1944 the United States Marine Corps had gone to the fire team concept. Instead of having one Browning automatic rifle per squad, we had now taken our squads, increased them to 13 men, and broke them down into four-man fire teams. Each of those fire teams did in fact have a BAR. We started issuing a weapon to a little bit more beefy Marines to hump them around, but that also meant that the Marine oftentimes, instead of having other people hump ammo for him, he was humping all his own ammo. Another thing that the Marines started having a time to do in conjunction with the flamethrower 
is they would also start loading those magazines with armor-piercing ammunition, which made this weapon decidedly effective, taking out fixed position and soft-skinned vehicles. And the Japanese were not noted for their heavy armor like that. Most of their tanks would fall under the category of light and medium tanks. So this, in conjunction with the flamethrower, proved very, very effective weapons. And that covers this part of the demonstration, ladies and gentlemen. We thank you very much.